a new one. You're technically interviewing me. <laughs> are, we, are we going? Yeah. Okay, so I just got a lot thing for NSR, and I'm here with Hayden for Wild Beast. So, hey. Uh, for people that are completely new to Wild Beast, what are you all about? Can you describe your sound? Uh, completely. People who are completely new to us, um, describe our sound. Um, yeah, in a way, we're probably the worst people to sort of describe it because we're so involved in it. It's always hard to sort of um, to sort of explain. It's like trying to um, describe the shape of a continent while being stood right in the middle of it. Um, but I suppose we, we I like the term baroque and roll, which has been sort of uh, dubbed for us, and also avant-garde pop. I think both of those things are fitting. So, did you aim to sound like you do, or did it just kind of evolve? We aim to sound um, unique and individual, in a sense, because we felt a lot of music that was being sort of force-fed to us wasn't representative of us as people and um, what we thought music should stand for, you know, which is um, to be innovative and to be outside and to and to sort of look at, cater for those people who feel... Um, they like the sort of more um, intricate and and subtle things in life, you know. There was, a, I think, we felt that a lot of music just sounded too much, too meat and too veg, if you sort of mean. It's, it was too four four two. <laughs> Again, uh, not great way of putting it, but um, yeah, we um, felt um, people appreciate the more outlandish and and, and subtle things of our music. I think. I mean, people often talk about your voice. I mean, mm. this must be brought up in every interview you've ever mm. heard as well. And personally, I don't, I don't really say why. I really like it. I find it's mm. really fitting. Thank you. And the band technically has two vocals as well. Mm. I mean, mm. yours just seems to polarise opinion. Mm. I mean, what's the most interesting way you've had that described? Your voice, that is. Uh, most interesting? Um, probably, I don't know. I mean... I think I mean I think it is represent I think that my voice is representative of our, of our philosophy really that um you know we we want to be um honest and be um unhinged and uninhibited in in our expression and I suppose the vocals my vocals are probably just the most immediately obvious part of that philosophy um and in a sense they do work in a bit like speed dating which is a way that it's been described you know you either very quickly become attached or you very quickly become um, put off um, which in a sense works for us you know because it's either well do you want to come and play ball because if you do we're, we're, we're keen uh, but if not don't worry about it you know I think we're not scared at all of people perhaps disliking us for what we well, what we stand for because um, there's no need for us to try and please everyone and end up pleasing no one we're better off just sort of sticking to our guns and, and, and looking after our family in a way so, I mean, how do you guys write your music? I mean, there's a, a degree of poetry in your words mm. as well. So do you start with the lyrics first and then add music, or is it the other way around? Or does it all just seem to happen? Uh, the words are very separate. The words are probably the most considered and 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 sort of um, studied part of what we do. Uh, just because, you know, words, the English language is such a tool, and, you know, it needs to be used carefully and and be made the most of uh, in that sense um yeah we when we're trying to take some so like quite sort of big subjects and you've got to try and compact them down and, and make them sort of digestible um and the music that then is instinctive and more um you know more of a feeling thing rather than a conscious you know thing so it's sort of a battle between the unconscious and the conscious yeah the words I simply narrate the sort of feeling that um, the music is trying to evoke. Well, this is a tough question that kind of follows mm. on. So, do you have like a personal favourite song? Is there a song mm. that has lyrics that holds particular resonance with you, or do you just kind of blanket like them all? Uh, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's very strange when it's like. Which is your favourite chapter of the book? You know, it's like, well, if you didn't have chapter one and yeah. five, you didn't have chapter two, three, and four. Um, but um, I'm often drawn to the fun part of plot, which is 
first song on our second album and um, just because that was a song where I decided I was going to take a big sort of political subject which was something to do with Fathers for Justice and a stunt they pulled off called the Fun Powder Plot and um, I, was, I sort of had to give myself a task of uh, describing that story from different perspectives. Um, you know, it's a good exercise, I suppose. Um, I was going to ask now about, because I'm just in a room with just you at the moment, mm. but how did the band come to be? How did you guys all get together and decide this is what you wanted um, to do? I don't know. I think, I mean, me and Benny, we all went to the same school for a start, so, you know, you don't meet each other officially. You sort of know of each other and then eventually, you know, groups sort of divide up and um, you understand who are the kids who sort of reflect how you feel and the kids that really don't. And I suppose we fell loosely into the same sort of circles and in that way knew of each other and I think always probably saw in each other uh, a care and a willingness for music, you know. I think there's certain something that separates people who love music and people who actually want to make it, um, make music. So... um I think we all sort of identified each other as makers um, and then bit by bit we sort of fell together you know by chance and by force you know you got to, we sort of forced our way through but equally you need the sort of right things to fall into place for you um, yeah so it's a, it's a long and complex story but loosely we went to the same school and then moved to Leeds together um, and spent much of our youth in garages and in uh, basements sort of um, banging drums and, and making loud noise and eventually refining it into what it is now. So were there any um, particular artists that influenced how you thought you wanted to make music in the future? Mm. I mean, who would they be? Um, I think, I mean, as a band, I think the Smiths were a huge sort of discovery for us when we were about 18 you know the fact that they actually stood for something they represented something to people um, we wanted to be that band that sort of you know stands for something um, you know they're, they're a complete package in their own right you know and we want, we want, we want to be that um, and they have many intricacies and many quirks and that was, that's what makes them all the more interesting and they're sort of four characters and um, I think we're sort of allowing ourselves to be, you know, sort of four characters in a soap opera in a way. Um, um, Leonard Cohen, I think, personally for me, was... I love the way he's, he spoke to people and sort of... Again, it comes down to being a character. He sort of invented this character for himself and he sort of, in a way, played out, you know, what you would want from him. Um... Bjork, I think, for me and Benny when we were first starting out, you know, sonically, I think we wanted to be a modern band. You know, we did, we didn't want to be retro or try and regurgitate the past. Um, and a later discovery was Kate Bush and Marvin Gaye and these sort of singers who were so personal in a sense. You know, they were so honest, and I think that always had a big mark on me. Did you guys ever have a sense when you were starting out that you'd end up where you are now with like TV appearances, European and US tours under your belt? Did mm. you ever think you'd get to where you are now? On, yeah, I mean, honestly, we did. I suppose you don't get there without really wanting to get there. That's the thing. You, you know, you've got to fully intend to get there because the sacrifice and the, and the amount you have to give um, means that you have to be fully determined and fully behind it. And... So, yeah, we, we always wanted to be there. Um, and still we have to stop and think, wow, how much of our lives do we have to give over for this? But um, on the good nights, you're willing to give everything. On the bad nights, you don't know what's left. But, um, no, we always wanted to be there, and, and it, it feels very good to, to be there now. Uh, what would you say the band's most defining moment to date is? Maybe being on Jules Holland, you know, maybe entering that circle in a way, I suppose... We've, it felt like an acceptance into um, not a mainstream circle, but there was a visibility that we then had. You know, we were then accepted as a band who who existed, I suppose. Whereas before that, we didn't quite feel as if we did exist. You know, in in the in the minds of 
um, music fans, I suppose. So, so you became a band that people could sort of discover and claim, almost. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, this is a loose point, but I've noticed underbellies on the Santander mm, advert at yeah. the moment. I mean, do you think that's boosted? <laughs> I mean, because I didn't mm, realise until mm-hmm. listening to the album a couple yeah, yeah. of times and put two and two together. I mean, mm. does that sort of indicate how you're perceived still, almost like a high profile yet subtle act? Or? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think the Santander thing is a big political issue for us you know it was a big moral issue because um you know it meant we were basically handing over our our artistic integrity to this this bank um which was um, a big deal for us you know um but you know People don't really buy records anymore. They don't have to. We don't. We can't expect people to listen to our music to buy our CD. That's a bonus, and you know we're very thankful for it. But we have the same respect and 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 love for the fans who don't buy our music. You know, um, that's just the way music is consumed nowadays. So I suppose we want to make a third album, and and in that sense, Santander, in a sense, has helped us do that. Um, but also, they took the tiniest snippet. They took a ten-second patch of that whole album, and. In a way, we may, you know, we maybe survived that one, but it did put, but it very quickly clari- clarified our view on on what is morally correct and what isn't. Um, and you know, in the long term, I think it'll help us because we've we've now we're now turning down things that we <laughs> that we otherwise perhaps um, wouldn't have turned down. You know, but we've had, we've got to protect something now. You know, it's almost as if we've. There's only so much we can accept. I was just going to say, like, finally, what does the future hold for Wild Beasts? Um, the future holds a third album, uh, and hopefully an illustrious career. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, finally, uh, well, finally, finally, doubly finally. Uh, how can people get hold of your music at the moment? It's the usual channels. How do they keep in touch with you? Um, yeah. YouTube, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, iTunes, yeah, record shops. I suppose we 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 do our best with um, with uh, with the latest technology. I'm a bit of a luddite, but you know, uh, yeah, we're on MySpace. <laughs> cool, that's great. Cool, thank that's you. Everything.